want you here. Just like the cattle ranchers scattered across the South Texas rangeland, Lou Griffin's day starts with the loading of feed. But Lou is no cattle rancher, and this is no farm. Still, there are hungry mouths waiting to be fed, and in the early morning stillness, their cries of anticipation echo across the flat and dusty desert. Welcome to Arishiyama West, Snow Monkey Sanctuary. Here on 58 acres of South Texas desert, 400 Japanese snow monkeys call Texas home. Back in the late 60s, Japan's snow monkey population was growing too large. The Japanese were faced with finding new homes for the monkeys or destroying them. A Texas rancher heard of the monkey's plight and brought 150 of the little guys to live on his ranch with the promise he would study and research them but never harmed them in any way. The rancher died soon after the monkeys came to Texas, but his dream is very much alive. The troop has grown to nearly 400 snow monkeys. It is an experiment that has drawn scientists from around the world and kept Lou Griffin here for the past eight years. I'm just a caretaker, and that's the focus of what we want to do. We don't want to fit into monkey society. We observe enough sort of as anthropologists to know the rules so we don't break the rules. But basically the entire focus of what we do is to not intervene. Day in, day out, Lou is the caretaker, feeding, watching, and recording every move and action of the troop. Long and lonely days on a ranch in the middle of nowhere, kind of a South Texas Diane Fossey. But Lou doesn't mind. She hasn't even let being a mother slow her down. Well, since she was 10 days old, she's been coming out here every day, so it's, uh, yeah, so humans are a lot more. Like, she's, she's liking having y'all here, because this is different to have humans to look at. Yeah, so humans, isn't that great? Wow! Well, this part is actually the fun part. You know, it's the fundraising part that's the awful part, I'm trying to keep, keep it going. But this is, this is the fun part. It's like, I always say it's like coming to a soap opera every day. You know, because you never know what adventures are going to await you. There were skeptics that said the monkeys could never survive, that Texas was just too different. Well, Texas did take some getting used to, but it suited the monkeys just fine. These days, they're even speaking Texan. The predators they meet out here, bobcats, coyotes, rattlesnakes, are different than they are in Japan. So some of the Japanese researchers recorded the Texas calls and took them back to Japan and played them for the Japanese, and of course they didn't speak Texan. They took the Japanese calls and played them here, and the monkeys that were born and raised in Japan still spoke Japanese. The monkeys that are born and raised in Texas don't speak Japanese anymore. They don't need to. You know, so you've got some bilingual monkeys, some that just speak Texan, and some that just speak Japanese. They've also adapted that behavior they had in Japan, which is swimming in the thermal pools to stay warm. So here they swim to stay cool. I used to teach elementary school in Dilly, and it was sometimes hard to remember um, if I was out on the playground, which I was watching, which species of primates. Yeah, that's why they're so much fun to watch. They're a lot like kids.
You might think it would get lonely out here day after day, but truth is, Lou almost always has other researchers watching and observing the troop. Heather Dundas is a zoologist from Alberta, Canada, who is spending a few months with the monkeys. When I'm doing a phone call, I just record everything. And any kind of data is good. I don't like being alone, but I do. I mean, I like that quiet time, because when I'm out here, it's quiet. I mean, it's myself. I have time to think. I mean, I'm observing them, but I also have time to think. And well, as far as their behavior, which is what I you know, observe mostly, all the studies have been just on their behavior, nothing intrusive. Um, they're complex, and they're really, lots of people find them hard to study and they don't like to study them mm -hmm. because when you're trying to build um, theories and you know you're trying to figure out what's going on in this animal's world it's really hard because they're I mean as Louie has told you there's so many different things going on and uh, they're more human so it's hard to to forget that they're they're animals and you try and humanize them that's it go finger Hi, hatch Part of the challenge of living with such a large troop of monkeys is following the rules and remembering who's who. The monkeys certainly remember, and they'll be the first to tell you when you make a mistake. Now, Rocky's mad at me he just because he sees I've got these bananas, which I shouldn't have done. Bananas have drugs in them, the medication, uh -huh. so I don't want to give him any. But that makes him, he's mad at me because I teased him, and he's the king. You're not supposed to tease the king, so I'm going to show him I don't have anything. Sometimes he'll slap me again. That was wrong on my part. You're not supposed to tease a king. You see, nobody moves up because Rocky's here. Now, when he walks off, these guys should move up, hoping to get something. That's amazing. But they're, they won't while he's around. And that's what social rank is about. It's not about fighting. It's about cutting down on fighting, lack of fighting. Everybody knows the rules. And here comes Tex. Let's see if we can get him to stand up. What, Tex? Here comes Rocky, so it won't stay very long. Oh, Tex, he's nervous. He's checking over his shoulder. So he's going to walk away before he gets in trouble. So there's not fighting. That's how you know social rank. It's not by fighting. It's by access to what you want. And if Rocky wants a peanut, he gets the peanut. Nobody else messes with him. Lou's story with the monkeys is one of great success. The Texas-born monkeys are stronger, larger, and healthier than their Japanese kinfolk. But it is a story with an uncertain ending. Lou is running out of time and money. The monkeys have all but cleared this land of vegetation. And the only money for operating comes from donations that are few and far between. The government refuses her funding because legislators don't see Lou's work as scientific, since the monkeys are allowed to run free but Lou wouldn't have it any other way. In the United States, there's been a long tradition of keeping all sorts of monkeys and primates, including chimpanzees and gorillas, in single cages and trying to study animals in that fashion. And whether you're looking at disease or birth defects or social behavior, an individual monkey in a cage is just like an individual human in solitary confinement. It's not normal. I can't stand the thought, say, even as, as much as Hatchet Face and I don't get on, of her ending up uh, somewhere in an enclosed environment with uh, only one bar to sit on. But if we can't find some funding and a new location, there doesn't seem to be any option for these animals. There's no zoo large enough to take 400 monkeys. Um, there's really no laboratory, single laboratory large enough to take 400 monkeys. So yeah, basically you're not just sending monkeys off, you're breaking up families. Over the years, Lou has learned to live with the monkeys at arm's length as only an observer. Still, her emotion runs deep for these animals. Her dedication seems endless. They are not her pets, but they are her life. She takes no pay for her work, and without at least $30,000 in yearly donations and 150 acres of new land, Lou will lose the monkeys. Her volumes of research and documentation will come to the last page and Texas will lose a great foreign treasure. I get to enter sort of another culture, and I get to learn the rules of another whole species, so it's a different way of looking at the world. Um, and I wouldn't 
be here if there weren't an emotional tie because that's certainly not a profit making sort of thing. It's not going to get wealthy or famous or younger or richer or any of those things, but it's fascinating. Uh, it's addictive, I guess. I can't quit, or I haven't figured out a way to quit yet. What we're trying to do is sell the concept of looking at an animal in its natural environment. And that would be more important in Texas than a lot of places because we have so many exotics here. And because we're trying to do, whether it's with the rhino or with whatever species, some salvation of species, transplanting species to new environments so they can survive in the world that we're quickly destroying. And this is an excellent example of a species that came to an entirely different environment and is flourishing. I'm Bob Phillips. This is a country. Good night. Thanks for hopping in and traveling with us. Now click the subscribe button for more videos like the one you just saw.